exchanging a warm round of applause as we welcome Saborno. Namaste. Am I free to give the keynote address? The world's youngest professor, Saborno Isaac's plane, just landed at Muscat Airport. It's 40 degrees Celsius in Oman. As soon as his plane landed, the Honorable Indian Ambassador to Oman, His Excellency Amit Narang, gave him a gift. Beautiful sunglasses to save his eyes from the sun. He is now on his way to Indian school al Bella to give his Middle East speech. An 11-year-old American child. He is in the 12th grade at Malvern High School. An undergraduate student at Brooklyn College. Graduate Namaste. student at Stony Brook University and as a CMT scholar at NYU Current Institute. He's doing research with NYU professors. A very good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Today, we all are gathered here to witness and be a part of the much-awaited interactive session of STI 2023 with an exceptionally young and talented personality who is popularly known as the god of mathematics. Yes, he is none other than Suborno Isaac Bari. Ladies and gentlemen, please rise as the national anthem of the People's Republic of India will be played for our chief guest, Suborno Isaac Bari. Punjab, Sindh, Gujarat, Maratha, Ravira, Utkala, Vanga, Vindhya, Himachala, Yamuna, Ganga, Uchala, Jaladhi, Taranga, Tava, Shubha, Name, Jage, Tava, Shubha, Ashish, Mage, Gahe Tava Jaya Gatha Jana Gana Mangala Dayaka Jaya He Bharat Bhagya Vibhata Jaya He Jaya He Jaya He Jaya 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 He His exceptionally extraordinary achievements have earned him the titles the God of Mathematics and the Einstein of the 21st century. With an impressive list of accomplishments, he's bestowed with the title of the youngest professor laureate at a tender age of 11, showcasing his unparalleled intellect and academic prowess. Further ado, we invite you to join us in giving a warm round of applause as we welcome Professor Laureate Suborno Isaac Barry. <laughs> This is my script. Today I would like to speak to you from the heart. So I'm not going to be using any sort of script except the smaller one that I have here. So, what will I be talking about today? Today I'm not going to be talking, well I will sort of be talking about math, but not about it in an academic sense. I won't be talking about the achievements that a certain country has made, but I'm going to talk to you all about a one specific question, one very similar to a question that some student asked me at last night's questionnaire. What is the importance of math and science? That question itself is actually not a question, but a problem. That question is very easy to answer. The importance of math and science is widespread in all fields. In economics, uh, it helps us make projections and predictions that fuel investors in our economy. In medicine, it helps us make several new innovations that save the lives of others. It fuels the backbones of our airplanes, and it's the foundation that every single engineer must learn, from electrical engineers to plumbing engineers to mechanical engineers, for their crafts that range from constructing power lines to fixing home appliances. And that's just a direct application, but that already encompasses much of our society. 
music theory, which is the study of music through math, helps prospective musicians decipher seat notation and understand how the layers to a track uh, may invoke emotion. Science fiction writers often must take higher level math and physics classes to understand the limitations of the science that they're working with and be more realistic. Take, for instance, Isaac Asimov, who is a very famous, not just academic, but science fiction writer as well. So, as you can see, this question is very easy to answer. Why is math and science so important? Well, there's your answer. But that's not the question I would like to ask today. The question I would like to ask today is, why do people ask this when there is such an obvious answer? There are many sides to that question, but I believe that there are four very important ones the role of mass appeal online scientists, the role of clubs and communities, the role of schools, and the role of your environment as well. They all play a role in how you view science and the level of your scientific awareness or your scientific ignorance. Now, of course, one great thing to address before we dive into why uh, some people are so scientifically ignorant is that sometimes it's not just a problem with the individual. Sometimes a child can be given to a cultural group uh, who views math and science as something to be put aside for more important duties. Something that people do when they have nothing else to do and that will not get you any real work. And this may be because in a lower wealth environment, the prevalence of math and science jobs, maybe uh, people just don't have the resources to study math and science. Those are the reasons that we'll be exploring in the future. But a vital question here is also how to address this mass disinterest in science as well as the disinterest of the individual. Now, first, and this may be a very indirect one, but I believe that mass appeal scientists are not just misleading, uh, sometimes not just misleading for kids, but also somewhat misleading for adults as well. There are several, actually hundreds of channels as I speak, uh, on several social media platforms that try to bring science to the masses, and they are very popular. Uh, they can get millions of uh, subscribers uh, and millions of views per day. Some of these channels can help spread scientific awareness very easily, but some of them backfire on their good cause. A lot of them accidentally trigger the Dunning-Kruger effect. They let their viewer know uh, as little as possible in order to not confuse the viewer. But then the viewer leaves thinking that they knew everything about science now, and they will stop seeking out future scientific content. They will stop seeking out science in general because they believe they've done as well as they can. And when they actually try looking into it more, that sort of ego or that sort of false sense of understanding will be completely destroyed. I believe that this is a problem that we are not letting people understand that these, uh, these videos, these different understandings of these concepts are not concrete. They do not contain the actual equations. They do not contain the advanced concepts as a whole. It's like reading the synopsis of a textbook chapter instead of diving into all the advanced terms and equations. It will give you the main idea, but if you were to take an exam on it, you'd fail. This is just one aspect that I believe is very harmful. But for the solution, that's very easy. There are several channels that have, in fact, figured this solution without me having to tell them. There were several people who have made it clear what their viewers are seeing is a dumbed-down version of the original concept. And since social media is so widespread nowadays, and there is so much more false information, we need to be skeptic of how dumbed down these are, and we need to do our own research into it. I myself was fooled in part by one of these scientific videos. I believe that after watching that one hour 30 sort of conference, I had gotten the keys to the universe. I had understood everything about every single advanced scientific subject, uh, subject through which I previously knew, knew nothing. But when I was encouraged to do some actual research on the subject uh, by my family and friends, I realized that concept was almost very far removed from what I was seeing in that video. 
That video was completely words. No equations except those thrown around to make it look special. So, I advise you all, when you see one of these pieces of science on social media, to be skeptic and be aware of how much they are excluding things, or how much they are just zooming in to one specific concept and cutting off all the advanced terms. Now, let me get into more, the more direct parts of things that are causing the scientific ignorance in our world. Secondly, I think that a slightly less uh, big cause, but still one in general, is definitely the lack of communities for math and science. There were several reading clubs or clubs for those who love history. In fact, in my school, there were 40 or 50 clubs. They've got the model you went, they've got the gaming club for whatever reason, but three or four clubs for math and science. That's almost nothing compared to the 36, almost 40 clubs that they have for every single other subject. And this gets even worse when you consider. My high school is top 25% in the region that I live in. So there are high schools far worse than mine that have maybe only one or even none at all are clubs that pertain to math and science. There are some of these schools around here and in the U.S. Uh, that do not support mathematical and scientific pursuits as much as they do others. The curricular clubs, well, are few and far between. There are math circles, for instance, but uh, they are not very widespread, and the entrance fees for them are very high as well, which means that most families won't be able to afford them. What can we do to alleviate this problem? Well, we can't lower the costs of math circles because obviously that would mean that the math circles would get worse education. We can't try replacing other clubs with math clubs because unless those clubs are very obscure, then it will dissatisfy at least some people. So what can we do? Personally, I believe that the solution to this, uh, although we, it's not concrete, we can contribute to solving this issue by working with each other. Not uh, through formal groups or anything, but through informal groups at least. If you have a friend that really appreciates math in the same way that I do, reach out to him, uh, them if you have any trouble, or if you've showed any interest in math in the past, or if you, in general, believe that math is just not for you, reach out to them, and maybe they'll show you why they like it so much. And for those of you who have an interest in math, like I do, reach out to your friends. Tell them why you believe math is so special, and encourage them to work on math themselves. Now, I know a lot of you in your heads are right now thinking, oh, that'll make me look like a weirdo. No one in my friend group likes math. But that is a problem in itself. There is so much stigma around math and science. It's not viewed like any other subject. It's viewed as a subject for nerds who uh, uh, don't like going outside and uh, do math all day. Now, I can say that this certainly applies to my brother, but not everyone who does math uh, is someone who doesn't like to go outside. People who do math, they should not be stigmatized by others. They should not be alienated from their friends and their family and their community because they like math instead of reading or history or literature. I think that the best solution to this problem is to once again work in your friend groups. Even if it's not so formal or it's not so official, it helps spread inspiration for math and science. There are two more issues that are widely prevalent and are still causing distaste for math and science. And it's very hard to get rid of these issues as well. First of all, there is the cultural stigma that I talked about before. Depending on what sort of environment your child, uh, a child is born into, uh, if they are given to uh, some sort of culture that shows no interest for math and science, then they will show no interest in math and, or science themselves. And if they really like math or science, um, just to hide it, they will put math and science in the corner so that they can satisfy their superiors to follow the group thing, to follow the peer pressure. In fact, you might be thinking, oh, there are barely a few kids who fall under this role. But I read a very, very profound story uh, named Educated for my English class uh, the other day. Uh, it was published in 2018, so you should uh, go check it out. 
a long story short, it's about a woman who is now the author uh, leaving uh, her traditionalist family that lived in the woods for a more modernist society. And it was fascinating to me to watch her recounting of how foreign math was to her and how her elder brother, who really loved studying, uh, was alienated by the rest of their family. And he was forced to work in the dangerous junkyard uh, by their father, who uh, potentially had paranoia. And this story has not just happened to the author, but also thousands of other kids worldwide. Whether they live in some random town in Idaho is a different story. But there are so many kids worldwide, on every continent, on every place on earth, who are being stigmatized or who are being put in the corner because they are made to believe and others believe that they should not be studying math and science like they are and they should adopt a more normal interest. And how do we fix this? There are a lot of different cultural factors, many of which are more divisive than even this issue, that contribute to this. There's, uh, there might be the economics of the situation, whether a child is born into a privileged family that has enough money for scientific tools and scientific equipment. So, what are we to do about this issue? Uh, there are a lot of different ways we could solve this, but I can't solve it with my single speech. It's one that we have to solve together as a whole. And the last problem I would like to address is that of the school system. The school system itself is a very difficult problem to solve. There are ve many, very many dispassionate teachers who are forced by uh, school boards or who are just bored out of their minds of teaching or who do not see the beauty in math and science and are simply doing it for the money, money, money. The fourth and final issue I would like to address is the educational system. There are many dispassionate teachers who are simply doing it for the paycheck and do not see the real reason or the real interest for math and science. <clears throat> when a student asks them what is the purpose of math and science, they are just as clueless. What can we do to fix this issue once again? What can we do to fix dispassionate teachers, greedy school boards, troublemaking students? And the truth is, the reality is, there's not much we can do. That's one of the biggest misconceptions in the educational system. There will never be a perfect student, there will never be a perfect teacher, and there will never be a perfect school. If something can go wrong, it will go wrong. So, what, the next best question is, what can we do to minimize these problems as much as possible? And that in itself is still a largely unanswerable question. It's one that takes a complete re-engineering re of the school system that we've been using for hundreds of years. One that requires an upturn in our current educational system that may cost hundreds of millions or even possibly billions of dollars. One that would be a radical change that would dramatically affect the lives of several students for better and for worse. And any solution that anyone could come up with, even me, on a whim probably have some unintended side effect on its own. This is a problem that can't take one individual or even a group to solve. Uh, this is a problem that takes worldwide scale collaboration. One that requires us to all work together. One that requires us to come together and re-engineer our education system as a whole. And from the big, small problems that could be solved by one individual, even just a random child giving a speech on a stage to nearly 3,000 people, to the big problems that can't be solved by one child, not one uh, adult, not one group of adults, not one school board, not even one government but a worldwide scale collaboration. From making, creating these initiatives, creating the answers to these vital questions, to pushing these initiatives forward, to eliminating this scientific ignorance, this lack of scientific awareness, that is one of the most important things that we must do today. So that the generations of tomorrow will understand what math and science means. So that the generations of tomorrow will be inspired by math and science. And will view it just like any other subject. Like reading. Like history. Like writing. Like art. And hopefully one day math will be, and science will be commonplace. And the question, why do we do math and science, 
someday, sometime, will never exist. The audience, let's put our hands together. Loudly organized by Indian School Almabela.